It was a victory for the Chinese people and a victory for people of the world. That's Chinese President Xi Jinping talking about the restoration of China's seat at the United Nations. Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu and this is The Heat. It's been 50 years since China retook its seat at the United Nations. Since then, China has been at the forefront of the UN on issues such as climate change, peacekeeping, poverty, and most recently providing vaccines to combat the COVID-19 pandemic. CGTN's Wang Siwen begins our coverage from Beijing. Maintaining international peace and security, promoting healthy relations and cooperation, Despite being a founding member and one of the five permanent members of the UN Security Council in 1945, China's seat was still occupied by representatives of the Kuomintang in 1949, even though it was overthrown by the Chinese people. A long struggle to restore China's lawful seat at the UN began. For years, it seemed that every effort was met with resistance heavily influenced by Washington. The UN General Assembly repeatedly voted down resolutions on the matter. However, during the 1960s, China's case for the restoration of its lawful rights began to find favor with more nations. And in 1970, it finally had a majority within the General Assembly. A year later, a proposal by the U.S. to create what it called two Chinas, or one China and one Taiwan in the U.N., was rejected outright by the Chinese foreign ministry. The countries of the world were divided into two camps, uh, the socialist camp and the U.S.-led capitalist camp. China belonged to the socialist camp, and the world organizations primarily dominated by the so-called capitalist camp. In part because of the Cold War and, and also in part because of the Korean War, China and the United States became sort of enemies. So the U.S. decided to support Chiang Kai-shek's regime to represent China at the U.N. and refused China's representation. That lasted for a long time. On October 25, 1971, China finally got the breakthrough it wanted. The UN General Assembly adopted the Resolution 2758 with an overwhelming majority. Voting is as follows, in favor 76, opposed 35, abstention 78. The draft resolution adopted. China will be notified accordingly. It restored all rights to the People's Republic of China and recognized the representatives of its government as the only legitimate representatives of China to the United Nations. China had waited 22 years. From being shut out to resuming its lawful seat to honoring its commitments for the past 50 years, China has been involved in the UN's undertakings and played an increasingly important role in the world body. Over the past five decades, China says it has made continuous efforts to support the United Nations. China currently contributes the largest number of peacekeepers among the permanent members of the UN Security Council. It has provided nearly 62 billion US dollars in assistance to 166 countries and international organizations. And it's now to taking action on climate change by pledging to pick its sail to emission before 2030 and achieve carbon neutrality before 2060. China has also benefited a lot from uh, being part of uh, uh, the international uh, system. Uh, probably 10 years ago, Bob Zelik, the undersecretary of the U.S. Uh, uh, State Department, he coined a phrase. He said China is a, a stakeholder of the existing international order. I think he's probably right. China still uh, has a huge stake in the existing international order. China wants the order to be stable. China wants the world to be prosperous. China endorses the UN to play a larger role. Following many early ups and downs within the UN, China finally found its feet on the international stage, and is keen to make a lasting and a positive impact. The Chinese government says it will always stay true to its original aspirations and is determined to connect more with the world. Wang Suwen, CGTN, Beijing. We spoke with the United Nations resident coordinator to China, Siddharth Chatterjee, 
on what this 50th anniversary means to China. We asked him what's been China's role and biggest accomplishment thus far as part of the United Nations. This is the 50th year of China returning to its lawful seat at the United Nations. Let me remind your audience that China was amongst the architects of the United Nations when the first and the, perhaps the first signatory of the UN Charter in San Francisco in 1945. But it was only in October 1971 that China's representation at the UN resumed. Since that time, the UN has had the great privilege of witnessing and supporting China in achieving one of the greatest periods of socioeconomic progress in, the, in, in world history, and particularly in the last, last 40 years. Now, during this time, China has lifted over 750 million people out of absolute poverty, invested in public health and in education, invested in human capital, making possible a happier and healthier workforce that contributed to economic productivity. It became the world's manufacturing center, multiplied its per capita GDP from a mere $180 in 1979 to an incredible $12,000 today, and we expect it to go to about $25,000 by 2025. Today, China is also the second largest contributor to the United Nations peacekeeping budget and has sent more peacekeepers to the UN missions than any other permanent member of the UN Security Council. China has played a vital role in shaping consensus needed for the Paris Agreement in addition to the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals agenda. But it is the SDGs that prove to, to us these are not singular accomplishments. The challenges facing the world, Anand, are so complex and intertwined as ever, requiring complex solutions. Indeed, China's biggest single contribution is its commitment to international cooperation and multilateralism. China has been a champion for multilateral efforts to address global challenges and has the will, the knowledge, the resources to contribute enormously to the Sustainable Development Goals in this decade of action. Well, you point out that China is a strong advocate of multilateralism. Let's look at how the world has uh, basically uh, tried to resolve the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, how has this policy of multilateralism, of international cooperation, contributed to solving, trying to resolve this very complex issue? You know, Anand, I think China understands very well that its success is bound up with the success of the world and vice versa. Despite the stresses that the COVID-19 pandemic has placed on international cooperation, China has acted with tenacity and with compassion, joining hands with many other nations to face this global challenge. I was in Kenya in, in, in March 2020, and China's contributions to of personal protective equipment and other supplies played a critical role during a time of global supply chain disruption. China's preventative and science-based public health response has set a model for the world to adopt in slowing the virus's spread to save lives and livelihoods. China has made significant contributions to the UN COVID-19 global humanitarian response, the WHO COVID-19 solidarity response fund, and the WFP global humanitarian hub which is in Guangzhou here in China. Perhaps most crucially, China is stepping up efforts to ensure COVID-19 are made a global public good. This was a pledge made by President Xi Jinping, and China is following through. It has pledged to provide over 2 billion vaccines by the end of this year, in addition to donating uh, about 100 million US dollars to the COVAX facility, supporting the donation of over 100 million doses of COVID-19 vaccines to developing countries to help the world put an end to this pandemic. Right. China has also shown that it is a strong supporter of other developing countries. In fact, the uh, Chinese State Councilor and Foreign Minister Wang Yi, he has said that China's vote at the UN will always belong to developing countries and be on the side of justice. How important is it for developing countries in the world to have a voice like China's at a forum like the United Nations? Very important. I mean, you know, it is absolutely pivotal for every country in the world to have a voice, and that is what allows the true spirit of, of multilateralism to actually happen. So, you know, there is 
you know, it's like the it's like the pandemic itself. You know, if everybody is not immunized, then perhaps the pandemic is not going away, and that is precisely how multilateralism needs to be working. So, therefore, China has, as a leader also of the G77, has done pretty incredible work in actually showcasing the importance of countries which which we did not have a voice in the past. And today, you can see an emergence of more and more African countries having an equal voice in South America, in Asia. So I find that China's leadership in the multilateral space is absolutely critical. You have been a UN resident coordinator in China since January. Um, what has that experience been like and what are your goals? You know, it's my first time in China. I'd only read about Chinese history. As a child, I grew up uh, next to Chinatown in Calcutta, West Bengal, India. And uh, coming here in January, I have to admit that every day I'm, in, I'm, uh, I'm inspired by what I see around me, what China has achieved and, and can achieve as a country, the maturity and spirit of a country with 5,000 years of civilization is, is ubiquitous. My vision is based on a belief that China has an important role to play in the community of nations. In this decade of action to achieve the Sustainable Development Goals, the UN can support China's ambitions and convene, connect, and catalyze stakeholders in leveraging China's development experience to benefit other countries, but also to help China achieve and fulfill its own aspirations as regards the SDGs, as regards uh, you know, its own development as regards the 14 five-year plan. I've lived and worked a long time in Africa, and I see incredible opportunities for a China-Africa partnership on which I'm, I'm tirelessly working on. You know, the pandemic has also underscored the need for a strengthened and renewed multilateralism. And this October will be the time for the United Nations and China to celebrate our 50-year relationship. China and the UN will reimagine innovate, reinvigorate, and continue the hard and daily work and dedicate ourselves anew to creating lasting prosperity for the people of China and for the rest of the world. Over to you. Siddharth Chatterjee, thanks for joining us. Now, as we continue to discuss China's 50th year at the United Nations, let's bring in our panel. Joining us from Memphis, Tennessee, is Joseph Gregory Mahoney. He is a professor of politics at East China Normal University. And in Beijing, the rest of our panel, Matteo Marchisio is country director in the Asia and the Pacific Division at the International Fund for Agricultural Development. And Henry Wong is the president of the Center for China and Globalization. Welcome to all of you. Uh, Joseph, let me start with you. 50 years since China was reinstated as a member of the United Nations. Uh, since then, it's played a leading role um, at the UN. Um, if we look at one of the major challenges facing the world right now, climate change, for instance. China was one of the lead signatories of the Paris Accord. We have COP26 coming up. Let's look at that particular issue. What kind of leadership can we expect from China on the climate issue? Well, you know, we just saw uh, yesterday uh, the, the new uh, green development guidelines coming out of uh, Beijing. And uh, this is, of course, uh, an announcement, like a lot of countries we're seeing announcements right now, ahead of COP26, which will start this weekend in Glasgow. Um, and what we've seen, I think, uh, with these green uh, development guidelines, as well as uh, uh, previous efforts, is fundamentally a, 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 an entrenchment of uh, a green culture a green development philosophy in China's national development plans. Uh, and so, you know, in this uh, uh, guideline we saw released yesterday, I uh, established clear targets for carbon peak by 2030 and carbon neutrality by 2060, uh, where the proportion of non-fossil energy consumption is expected to exceed 80 percent. And uh, more immediately, uh, to, to, to start moving towards the 2030 goal, uh, the country, uh, it was announced the country will build on uh, um, uh, constructing an economic system of green, low-carbon, and circular development, uh, which will include a lot of industrial upgrading uh, and uh, uh, trying to improve energy uh, utilization efficiency in key industries, uh, with goals there for 2025. Now, if we look at this and, and the report that came out uh, earlier this year on the establishment of the moderately prosperous society and all the achievements that have also been scored in cleaning up uh, the water uh, and the air in China, 
we see that there's a sort of a comprehensive green approach, a new green culture taking root. And uh, I think this is not only uh, a significant contribution uh, for the Chinese uh, people and their well-being, but also a significant contribution for improving, uh, improving the global environment. Matteo, uh, great to have you with us on the show. The impact of climate change is, is, of course, already being felt around the world. I mean, if we look at sub-Saharan Africa uh, for a moment, um, we've seen that part of the world experience droughts, rising temperatures, rising sea levels as well. Uh, we just heard that 40 million people in that uh, part of the world have been plunged into extreme poverty. Um, China has, of course, been extremely successful in alleviating poverty. How can the Chinese experience and Chinese expertise be extended to the rest of the world? Well, uh, good morning, everyone, or good evening. Um, I think, basically, China and, and the UN can work together in promoting poverty eradication and sustainable development worldwide in three ways. Uh, first of all, through multilateralism. Uh, China is the second largest contributor to the UN. And as uh, President Xi Jinping uh, highlighted during his remarks on the occasion of the uh, 50th anniversary of the recognition of the people of China uh, as, uh, as, um, uh, as representative of the government of China to the UN, an important supporter of international cooperation, so multilateralism and international cooperation. Second, as an advocate and a contributor to the work of the United Nations by promoting uh, uh, peace, uh, security, um, sustain the sustainable development goals, uh, and the fight and uh, supporting the fight uh, against uh, climate change. And third, uh, by sharing uh, to other developing countries uh, the successful lessons uh, generated through its process of poverty reduction through what we call South-South cooperation, that is to say cooperation between uh, developing countries. I think these are the three mechanisms by which China and the United Nations can contribute to poverty reduction and sustainable development goals worldwide. Henry Wong, you know, as Joseph told us a moment ago, China is deeply committed to the battle against climate change and shifting to a green economy. But we also are aware that not all countries in the world have that same kind of commitment. So how can China use forums like the United Nations to try and persuade other countries that they need to have the same kind of urgency and commitment to battling climate change. Yeah. <clears throat> Question uh, thank, you. thank you. Thank you, Hanno. Yeah. yeah. I think this is actually uh, a great time to review the uh, uh, progress of UN and also, of course, at this occasion uh, when China rejoined the UN uh, at 50th anniversary. I think UN is is the parliament of, of the world, basically. You know, we have a. It's a, such a great state. We should really strengthen that. We see it has been weakened somehow in the last number of years. And I, I think what China can do is really to play more. I mean, now China is already uh, the second largest uh, uh, donator to the UN budget, but maybe could be uh, in the future be even larger. So, so I hope that uh, China can play more active role on that. But as a matter of fact, the UN was uh, the name of UN was coined uh, uh, by the Franklin Roosevelt, and uh, and then uh, China was the first uh, signing on, on the charter of the UN. And I think, but now. The UN needs to be upgraded now. I think, uh, you know, we, what we found in the UN, the, the world population is only 2.8 billion, something like that, uh, 2.5 billion. Now it's 7.8 billion. You know, it's such a great uh, uh, increase of the world population. Yet the structure of UN, I think, needs also to be uh, innovated as well. For example, maybe, you know, you see now ASEAN is coming, EU, and then African Union. We have many uh, regional uh, organizations coming up. So how they can play a, a, a better role there. And also, of course, we see, of, of course, you mentioned climate change, but it's more than that as well. For example, the world infrastructure is crumbling. And uh, of course, China stands out to be one of the best uh, infrastructure uh, country in the world. Now, I think that can be really, you can really work on, on that, uh, get all the, uh, the countries, uh, you know, r realize the objective. So I think, you know, from UN 1.0 to UN 2.0, we should really work on that. But unfortunately, we see U.S. is really back off quite a bit of that. but. UN General Assembly is, is, is based in the U.S., is in New York. Right. So, so I, the P5 countries should really work together with all the other member countries. And then we sh should really have this uh, you know, UN Charter be uphold. And, of mm -hmm. course, we should really uh, upgrade the UN uh, to some extent. And then really let's fight fighting all those uh, imminent challenges like climate change and infrastructure shortages and things like that. And pandemic, of course.
Matteo, I'm sorry, you wanted to say something on the question of global cooperation and multilateralism. Hi, Matteo. Oh, I couldn't hear whether the, the, the question was addressed to me uh, or to the other speakers, uh, but I fully agree with what uh, has been said. Uh, I think that the, the China role in uh, promoting uh, cooperation uh, among countries is key for promoting multilateralism uh, across the world and thus to achieve uh, sustainable development goals, uh, poverty reductions, which in the end uh, are global public goods. So everyone benefits from, from those uh, 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 achievements worldwide. Joseph, looking at China's 50 years at the United Nations, uh, it's been deeply involved with UN peacekeeping operations. In fact, it contributes troops to peacekeeping operations around the world. It's also a financial backer of peacekeeping operations. Uh, I mean, put this into context for us. Why is this so important, firstly, to China? And why is it so vital for the UN to have a country like China there? Well, I think the first thing we should note is that China has been a major contributor to world peace in a number of ways. And let's just list uh, three right off the bat. First, uh, we see that uh, after the Civil War, China uh, moved fairly quickly to establish a secure, sovereign nation, bringing peace to its people after uh, more than 100 years of uh, turmoil. Uh, this was a major uh, contribution to peacekeeping. Second, uh, China has not been an aggressive nation uh, the way others have been uh, throughout the Cold War and beyond. And this has been uh, a positive as well. And thirdly, uh, China uh, has been uh, the biggest uh, contributor uh, in terms of personnel among the P5, the permanent members of UN Security Council, uh, uh, to the peacekeeping operations. Uh, this is something that when uh, Xi Jinping uh, uh, came to power uh, um, uh, a, a couple of years later, he, in 2015, he uh, made an offer of uh, several thousand more troops to reinforce the organization's operation. And currently, uh, uh, China has more uh, um, uh, uh, personnel in the peacekeeping force than all other uh, permanent security uh, council members combined. Um, and it's only second to the U.S. in terms of uh, providing funding to the operation. So I think this is uh, uh, indicative. Uh, and by the way, I think that the, the, the last number I saw that the U.S. has contributed 29 uh, 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 people uh, to um, to uh, uh, UN uh, peacekeeping operations, whereas China over the years has contributed more than 50,000. So I think that, that this is, is clearly a, a, a demonstration of a commitment not only to global peace but also to the United Nations. Which, if we recall, you know, the real fundamental purpose originally of the United Nations was to promote peace, uh, and uh, and in this sense, uh, China is playing an outsized role compared to some of its uh, 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 fellows on the Permanent Security Council. Matteo, China's signature foreign development program is the Belt and Road Initiative. It has invested in developing infrastructure uh, in countries around the world. It's also been involved in expanding trade with those countries. That program has not been without its critics, but what do you make of that effort? Well, I think that uh, um, the Belt and Road Initiative, as well as any other initiative to promote uh, international cooperation, is worth uh, um, is worth trying. Um, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, there are so much uh, um, lessons that can be learned from, uh, uh, in the case of poverty reduction, from the, the um, from the efforts and achievements of uh, China in uh, in reducing poverty that can be shared uh, to the rest of the world. So international cooperation for me is one of the key uh, mechanisms that allow a, a gradual um, development of all countries. So any mechanism, any platform that can serve that purpose uh, um, is, is definitely uh, welcome. Um, perhaps let's look at what uh, uh, specific lessons can, uh, less, can China share with the rest of the world. And I would probably name uh, three, specifically to poverty reduction. First, uh, uh, China's uh, uh, success in reducing poverty was, uh, was, uh, can be attributed to the right policies. Uh, right policies, I'm thinking to the the responsibility system, uh, uh, economic reform and opening up, right investment, productive infrastructure, and, uh, and uh, investment in the social system. Right sectors, ed, um, education and health. So if we, if uh, through those platforms, investments, uh, uh, reform can be shared to the rest of the world, 
the world can learn from, uh, mm -hmm. from the experience of China. Henry Wong, what can you tell us about China's multilateral efforts to, to combat the, uh, the COVID-19 pandemic? Yeah, I think that uh, that's really important uh, 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 that we really has to benefit each other by uh, learning from each other. For example, China now has been relatively contained the COVID-19. Uh, so I think there are some of the methodology, particularly also vaccine. Also, China can really put more efforts into uh, uh, de uh, helping developing countries, but particularly Af African and, and many other different countries are really vital to contain that. But also, I think also China probably can open up a, board, a bit more of these border <laughs> exchanges so, so we can facilitate the uh, people movement. I think with the Winter Olympic come up, we probably can see how we can really, China can maybe relax in some of its border control and then maybe uh, have a better way of, uh, of uh, handling that so that we can really do that. But I think I, I would like to add, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, China, you can really do better, of course, by reducing the property reduction. China already reduced 800 million, which represents 70 percent of, uh, of the global property produ reduction, which is uh, number one or priority of SDG 2030. Also, I think that, uh, uh, you know, you and peacekeeping force can really be more active. You know, like places like Afghanistan, Syria, or other troubled places. You know, you should be there rather than other countries unilaterally sending troops. We should have, you will have more troops played in peacekeeping, security keeping in the world. So I think there's, there's a lot of role can be, can be played in strengthening the UN so that we can really have a better uh, uh, future that uh, through the consultation of the UN and then strengthening the UN, upgrade the UN, and uh, let's make the world a better place, particularly pandemic fighting. UN should take more leadership. WHO should take more leadership. Right. And then, you know, standardize the vaccine around the world. So that's all the things we can do, of course. Joseph, very quickly, I've only got about 40 seconds left. Uh, looking ahead, how does China strengthen the UN? I think China just has to stay on point. It needs to tell its own positive stories. It needs to continue to press uh, for reform in these organizations that promote uh, multilateralism. And it needs to stay on point with uh, peaceful relations with its neighbors and anyone else in the world who wants uh, to instead uh, view China as a competitor. There's a lot it can do uh, to, to push for peace, uh, to push for a green environment. And let's hope that that's uh, what Beijing continues to do. And we have to leave it there. Thanks to all of you for being with us. I'm Arnold Nadu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching.